to go over I'm going to go over all the different aspects of a rain garden um but our our real expertise is when it comes to plants and I know that you all just being part of wild ones are very interested in the native plants but might have other questions about sizing the rain garden and such that usually an engineer handles for us uh but but I'm prepared to talk about it. Um, we've just done a little research and I'll, and I'll tell you about where those resources are. So we provide design planting and maintenance plans. And we, we also on occasion will do the planting and the maintenance. I understand that some of you might be looking for help. Um, and so, you know, we can talk about that. Uh, we can coach or manage a project. Uh, we can help with only certain tasks. We can work alongside you, or we can just provide you some guidance today and hope that you are able to take this on yourselves. We can be available for follow-up if, if you need any other guidance. So let's just start with the basics. Uh, what is a rain garden? It is a depressed area in the landscape that can collects rainwater. And we want to acknowledge that rainwater, uh, you know, it it um when you get into that suburban environment, there's a lot of things that are interrupting rainwater soaking into the ground like it used to. We have rooftops, driveways, sidewalks, roads. And so incorporating these rain gardens is really helping to promote that infiltration that used to be here. And uh, without those rain gardens, you know, the water just pouring into the gutters or the streams, however, it's, it's leaving your property and going to its next place does cause problems downstream that we'll get into on some of these slides. Um, just a simple rain garden layout. Can you see my cursor? Kathy, will you nod for me if you can see my cursor? I wanna know if... I don't see your cursor. No, how about now? No. Okay. Oh, now I do. Well, yes. Oh, you do, okay. So, so just the, the basic path of stormwater leaving, leaving the rooftop going into the rain garden, it will take a couple of routes. What we want it to do is infiltrate into the ground and uh, continue as water flow underground. Depending on the size of your rain garden, some might leave uh, out uh, designated outfall, but by then we're hoping that it's less and it's cleaner. So why do we wanna have a rain garden? So like we talked about, those impervious surfaces are really interrupting, soaking into the ground. Uh, rain collects pollutants from all aspects of where it lands and it flows from, from a house. It's going to, if you're in town, it's most likely going to flow eventually into a curb and gutter system. And then we don't, typically think about it anymore, but where it goes from there is into a wastewater treatment plant and it is treated for pollutants and then it is dumped back into the stream. And a lot of our communities in Illinois and beyond are having a problem meeting their, meeting compliance for their pollutants. So a lot of times these wastewater treatment plants are dumping polluted water into the streams. And there's new regulation coming down on them. It's going to be very expensive for them to make some required upgrades. And that turns into, that translates into tax dollars. So what we are also doing with our rain gardens is we are being good stewards to our communal taxes. So, Just a little 
more about the difference between the natural environment and the urban environment and why rain gardens are so important. In a natural environment, there's more evaporation, there's more infiltration, and there's less runoff. So this diagram from the Nature Conservancy shows that about 10% of stormwater is running off into a stream from a natural area. And what this doesn't show is that it is it is cleaner. From the urban environment, that water doesn't have anywhere to go uh, other than the stream. It has less evaporation, it has less infiltration, and it has more runoff. So 55% runoff compared to the 10% runoff in the natural environment. So in a way, our goal with the rain garden is get is to get more toward that 10% runoff number. Okay, so when we are creating a rain garden, we're, we're creating an asset out of the stormwater instead of treating it as waste. We are reducing flooding. One important thing about reducing flooding is when a storm happens, typically water is trying to get to the same spot all at the same time. And so a rain garden, by detaining some of that storm water uh, just a little bit, if everybody does a little bit, it is easing the rush of water that's going to the, down, the downstream water body. And that's called flashy hydrology where the storm hits, all the water goes to the stream at the same time. The stream fills up its banks, it blows out its banks. Uh, we end up with bare soil, 90 degrees, um, incising banks, those sorts of problems. And then after the storm is over, usually that water goes way back down. So when you're when you're driving along on a clear sunny day, you'll see this little little stream in the bottom of an area that has huge banks that might be quite eroded depending on where you're looking. So a rain garden and other best management practices like it help with that scenario so that we're holding back some of that water. So it's not all trying to go downstream at the same time. So I'll show you in a little bit some of the numerical benefits of of uh, rain gardens, but it's exponential because it doesn't even include all those things that it's helping downstream. Um, we are filtering pollutants, we're promoting infiltration and uh, sending less water to those storm drains, and therefore we're improving water quality within our within our watershed or within our region. So, this picture shows a nice example of a storm of a, a rain garden that is just located between the street and the sidewalk. And it just shows that they don't all have to be round or teardrop shaped, or it, you can have a linear rain garden. Um, I know that tonight we had, I don't know how many people are actually here, but we had 150 people sign up. And so if each person had a 300 square foot rain garden, each of those 150 people, we would create one acre of rain garden. And that's just us on this call right now. So you can see where a little bit, if everybody does a little bit, it really adds up. So if you're looking at a residential area, the literature will say that there is about 30, uh, sorry. Oh, I don't, I, I was just about to say something that I don't actually have written down. <laughs> so let me say it a different way. The uh, literature will say that there is about 7% um, yes, a rain garden needs to be about 7% of the size of its drainage area. Um, when it's treating in, uh, impervious surfaces only. Okay, so a, a rain garden 
let's say you had a hundred acres, you'd need a seven acre rain garden, 7%. So in a low, low density, single family home neighborhood, your rain garden uh, needs to be about 2.6% in because that will handle all of the impervious surface. Plus there's a lot of turf and, and areas that rainwater is able to soak in. And so if you're in that kind of residential neighborhood, if you have one acre of rain garden, you're able to treat 38 acres of residential development. And if you are, if you have a properly sized rain garden, you are able to reduce, usually when we look at watersheds and the work we're doing, we're usually focused on uh, nutrients and, and uh, sediment. And so the sediment is, or suspended solids, you can arrest 75% by putting in the rain garden plus 60% of the nitrogen and 65% of the phosphorus. So if we look at our one acre example, we could suspend 8,800 pounds of suspended solids every year. We could uh, filter out 137 pounds of nitrogen and 20 pounds of phosphorus. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of the, of the how we quantify what's going on in rain gardens. And these numbers come from the EPA, the Illinois EPA. And what I just showed you was in sewered neighborhoods. So when we're in unsewered neighborhoods, the percentage of efficacy is the same, but you have more area where water can soak in. So you have less pollutants to filter out in the first place. And so what you end up with is if you have that same one acre of rain gardens, you're um, arresting about half of the pollutants compared to one acre in a sewered area. So there are a lot of different benefits when you start, when you use native vegetation in your rain garden, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but those benefits um, can be also quantified. So if you're looking at Kentucky bluegrass, which is your typical lawn grass, the roots of that Kentucky bluegrass are about four inches deep. And so what you have under the surface of the ground is you have a sponge and your sponge is about four inches thick. And that's, it can take in, in the water. And then it kind of hits a compacted layer after that. And you're not really soaking in as much. And when you look at native plants, their root systems are so vast that engineers can uh, use um, eight, the, if the top 18 inches of native plants can be used in engineering calculations for how basically now you have a sponge that is 18 inches thick rather than four inches thick. And when engineers are calculating how much detention is needed, maybe if they're creating a new subdivision, for example, um, they are able to use an 18 inch sponge or 18 inches of, of uh, water um, detention underground. And so other benefits are stabilized soil, improved water and air quality, aesthetics, habitat for wildlife, heat island effect mitigation, and carbon sequestration, all of which are enhanced by native plants. So just an example, uh, I live in Rockford. We have a lot of turkeys and the mom, mama turkey brought her babies to my rain garden and they were they would just be there every day seeking cover, but also lots of pollinators. Um, as soon as we put in our rain garden, which is maybe 20 feet by 50 feet, it's not very big. Uh, we all of a sudden had 
had um, hummingbirds at our house and various kinds of butterflies and hummingbird moth and so many pollinators you know you get on into one flower and look at the head of one flower and might count 10 different insects on that one flower so it's just buzzing we've put rain gardens and native plantings in various parks in rockford and um, after about three or five years of management then they really take on a, a beautiful aesthetic so let's get into creating your rain garden we're going to go through identifying the goals selecting the site and determining the size some design considerations and then building and maintaining your rain garden. So to identify the goals, if you're putting in a rain garden, you're going to treat stormwater runoff, but you also might have a goal, particularly of providing wildlife habitat. And maybe you have specific wildlife in mind. A popular one would be pollinators because of the size of a rain garden and the appropriateness of that type of habitat. Um, another goal might be stress relief or creating a landscape a landscaping interest. The goals are totally your own. One thing I want you all to remember, and I think some of us, when we're talking about native plants, um, ha feel that they need to be wild. And so I want you to remember that this is your garden. And if there's something going on in your garden that isn't interesting landscape wise, or is maybe it's stressing you out, you don't like it, it's okay. You can pull it. Even if it's a native, you can pull it, you can replace it with something else. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, you don't have to let it go. So selecting a site, there are some rules of thumb and these are all guidelines. One hard guideline is to be at least 10 feet away from your foundation. Going back to that slide with the roots, uh, some of those roots, especially if they have a tap root, like um, for instance, the, the um, like compass plant, prairie dock, those kind of species have a large tap root that can, if you have a crack in your foundation, those roots can get in there. So just stay 10 feet away from your foundation. Um, you wanna pick a spot between the source and the source in this case is the impervious surface. So your rooftop, your driveway, your sidewalk, whatever you're trying to treat, pick a spot between the source and where the water normally runs off of your property. That's a, it's just a guideline. I mean, you can really have a, you can really put a rain garden anywhere if you're going to infiltrate all the water. But I like to recommend that there's some overflow outlet in case you get a really big storm and that water is going to overtop your uh, rain garden. Let's put in some sort of out controlled outlet and have that outlet go to the place where the water usually leaves your property. Uh, you don't want, if you have a septic system, you do not want your rain garden directly over it. And here's one guidance that I like to ignore, not in a wet area. The nature of a rain garden is you're trying to infiltrate the water into the soil. So you want soil that's going to absorb that water quickly. Um, if you have a wet area that you want to turn into a native area and you want it to hold stormwater, that's okay. Um, you might just be calling it a constructed stormwater wetland rather than a rain garden, but you could follow all the other advice. Um, put it in, if you have, full or partial sun that's going to help with, with the evaporation. Again, if you just have a shady area, you can still have a rain garden. Um, 
And the flatter, the better that hap that is for the base of your rain garden and it's a guideline as far as making it easy to dig. And you can pick a pleasing shape. Crescents work well, teardrops work well. Something that looks intentional. And if you make it look intentional, it will, um, it'll blend with your traditional, if you have more traditional landscaping, it will blend more easily. And then put it where you can enjoy it. Mine's located right outside of my bathroom window and it's the first thing I see every day. As an example, this house is on a slope above this, what is half, the bottom half of this is a rain garden and the top half is just a vegetated slope. And so it was hard to mow. It was ugly, in my opinion. So that's why we chose this area for the rain garden. Okay, so determining the size. This is really personal. How much space do you have available? How much can you manage? I think it'd be easy to get excited and take on too big of a project. And it's important to know what you can handle and what you can maintain because stewardship is more important than what you plant. How much runoff do you have? And what soil types do you have for infiltration? So one question that I think is on everybody's mind is how deep does this rain garden have to be? And so we'll go through a couple slides here to determine the size, the sizing of the rain garden as far as depth and slope and that sort of thing. So a typical rain garden is about four to eight inches deep. And when you consider the slope, if you have a very flat slope of less than 4%, then your rain garden doesn't have to be as deep, three to five inches. As you get more slope, just think about cutting away the side of a slope. You're going to have to get deeper to achieve that same depth as you would in your less than 4% slope area, three to five inches. If you've got a slope of eight to 12 inches, you're gonna have to dig it deeper and the guidance is eight inches in order to get um, to get that same area that's going to uh, hold the water. So calculating your drainage area, let's take a roof, for example. If you go around your house and you look at your downspouts, typically a house will have you know, a downspout for a quarter of the roof. So you might have four downspouts on, on, if it was a square house, each corner of the house. So you, you're, if you're routing the water from your rooftop to your rain garden, then your drainage area is the rooftop that drains off that direction. So you wanna figure out how much of your roof is going to a certain downspout and how big is your roof? So if you have a roof that is, let's just for easy math, say you have a roof that's a thousand square feet and you have a square house and you have a downspout on each corner of your house. And one of those downspouts is taking a quarter of that. Well, then a quarter of your thousand square foot roof is 250 square feet. And that's simply how we calculate the drainage area. It has everything to do with the impervious surface. So it's really um, it's really all that matters is how big is that impervious surface. The other big question regarding how big your rain garden should be is what kind of soil do you have? If your soil is sandy, it's going to infiltrate water very quickly. If it is clay, it's hardly going to infiltrate very quickly. It's not going to infiltrate very quickly at all. And um, 
if it's silty or better word for it, maybe silty is the wrong word, actually. If it's loamy, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. So in order to assess your soil, you dig a hole to the, to the, you know, you, you're probably looking at, well, we, we do want to look at wherever that base is going to be of your rain garden. You want to dig to that depth and, and assess the soil that's going to be the base of your rain garden. So if you dig to that depth and then you just take a, uh, maybe a, not even a golf ball size chunk of soil and squeeze it in your hand so you get rid of all of the integrity of that soil. So it's just a lump and you want it moist, not soaking wet, but moist. And, um, and then you can make a ribbon out of that soil using your fingers. And if you, if you can ribbon it, then it's not sand, it has some soil in it. And if your ribbon breaks um, before one inch, you have sandy loam. If your ribbon breaks one to two inches, you have loam. And if you get a ribbon that's over two inches long, you have clay. And then you can, you can feel the texture of that. And if it's gritty, it's sandy. And if it's really smooth, it's silty. And so the more sand you have in your soil, the faster it's going to infiltrate. And you're going to want to pick drier species. If you have clay, it's going to in infiltrate much slower. You might end up with wet spots and you will want to pick species that tolerate more wetness. So this is getting really intricate. And my advice is as long as you have an outflow, you don't have to have it perfect. As long as you have a way for that overflow water to escape. Um, but if you're trying to calculate for the most infiltration into your rain garden, then you wanna use this chart and this is, we got this from Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I'll give you another source. And there's a slide at the end with these other sources. It's called Blue Thumb. And Blue Thumb has a, a, a handbook for homeowners that has this information in it. In fact, it has all of the sizing information in it that I'm going over tonight. And so here's a chart where it you've, you've decided you've assessed your soil, you've decided what kind of soil you have. And by the slope, figuring out, you know, what slope you have, you've decided how deep your rain garden needs to be. Then the numbers in this chart are um, calculate, they're, they're used to calculate how big your rain garden needs to be. Okay. So this number is simply multiplied by the drainage area you found. So back to our example of the rooftop, the thousand square foot rooftop, where a quarter of it's running off one downspout, we're gonna route that downspout to our rain garden. We've got 250 square feet of drainage area. So depending on the soil type you have, you take 250 square feet multiplied by this number, and that's how big your rain garden should be. So um, let's just take this one because it's easy math. Clay soil with a rain garden that's more than 30 feet from the downspout is multiplier of 0.10. So if we have a 250 foot, 250 square foot drainage area, we need a 25 square foot rain garden to handle it. If we have clay soil and our rain garden is more than 30 feet from the downspout. Okay, so now I'm gonna move away from sizing and we're gonna talk about some other design elements to consider.
you're going to want to in consider how is the water getting into your rain garden? What vegetation are you going to plant? We're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk about soil again, but in a different way. Are you going to use the native soils that are present in your yard, or are you going to use bioretention soil media? And how is the outlet, how is the water escaping from your rain garden if there's overflow? So types of inflow, I'm going to go through a couple examples. A lot of these are more urban than most of you are going to encounter, um, but I think it's worthwhile. They're interesting. If nothing else, they're interesting. Okay, so here's an example of a curb cut where the water just simply goes into the rain garden through this little cut in the curb. A covered inlet would be if there was a if 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 there's a sidewalk and you're wanting to drain from the street through this covered inlet into a garden on the other side. A depressed drain where your water can go, can enter your rain garden from underneath the ground. It's an interesting idea. Here's one that I can see more readily in a residential yard, and that would be a trench drain. Um, well, actually the trench drain is right here on the, uh, along the sidewalk, and then it goes into a rock line swale into the rain garden. And then a pipe that discharges runoff into a rain garden. This could be the extension of a, a downspout. This could be buried under your yard, extending the water directly from your downspout into your rain garden. All right, so vegetation. When it comes to vegetation, there's a lot of good choices of species. I'd like to present vegetation in certain, certain characters of vegetation that you want. You want vegetation that is resilient, especially to different, uh, different water depths, native. You want some, you want vegetation that's diverse um, to, a, to a certain extent. It depends on the size of your rain garden. You want, you probably want blooms all year round. That'll give you the aesthetic appeal. Um, you want to make sure that your vegetation is correlated with what soils you have and also what sunlight you have. But the soils is, is tied to what moisture levels you have. Um, Let's see, the level of required maintenance, that's an important one. Are you going to be able to recognize the species that you put in? Uh, do you want to attract pollinators or are there any other ecosystem services that you want that vegetation to, um, to perform? Okay, so with diversity, uh, there's diversity of species and diversity of heights. And then the mix between greenery and blooms and of different ecological functions. So diversity of heights. I've done a lot of experimenting in my own yard and I have found that if you, if you want your rain garden to be a certain height, don't plant anything taller than that. Because even if you in the middle, maybe in the middle, you want some taller stuff and then you want to surround it with uh, shorter things. Uh, I shouldn't say don't because you can do that. You just have to manage for it. And if you don't manage for that, then eventually the species will decide where they want to be and you'll have the various heights that you put in that garden will just be mixed everywhere. And so if you want a garden that's, you know, maybe three foot tall grasses with wildflowers that are no taller than, than four feet, 
the easiest thing to do is just just plant those species and those species only. Um, greenery versus blooms, depending on what plant material you'll, you're using, which we will get into. If you're using plugs or seedlings, then a good rule of thumb is three grass-like species to one wildflower. If you're using seed, a good rule of thumb is 60% of your seed mix being wildflowers and 40% of your seed mix being grass-like species. And then species that have year-round appeal, um, spring, it's important to have cool season grass-like species that can be sedges or grasses that are cool season that will come up much earlier than the warm season grasses. And summer is when you're going to get most of your blooms, but there are a couple good spring bloomers. Uh, autumn, again, just a couple good bloomers there. And then winter, some of the grasses have really nice colors that will last through the winter. Um, pollinator friendly, the most important one for monarch butterflies is milkweed. So I strongly suggest you have milkweed in your garden. But a lot of the native plants will attract pollinators. Legumes are nitrogen fixers. So if you have some legumes in your mix, that's going to be good for your overall planting. And um, if you can diversify the structure of the plants, that will also be good for insects and, I mean, wildlife in general, but mostly insects use various structure of plants. Okay, now what kind of soil are you using? Um, you can use your native soil. That's whatever you find in your yard, that's fine. If you run into sub layers, uh, subsoil layers that are less black, less nutrient rich, then you might wanna over excavate your rain garden by four to six inches and fill it with topsoil. So, you know, in the beginning when you're digging, stack that topsoil, put it aside in a stack and then over excavate by four or six inches and then put the topsoil back in. Um, the bioretention soil media is something that I wanna bring up, but I haven't used very much. I have actually, I haven't used it at all. And I think with natives, the only reason you might want to use bioretention soil media and, and what it is, it's, it's just a mix of sand and compost and um, clay. It has a certain amount of organic material in it. It's, a, it's also sometimes called an engineered soil matrix. Basically, it, it, if you put it in, you, you over excavate and then you fill your rain garden with the bioretention soil media, you're going to have good infiltration. So that's the benefit of doing it that way. Um, with na native plants aren't going to need any special soil, as you probably all know. They are very tolerant of poor soils. Okay, so now the outlet. Um, we want, I want to encourage an outlet on your rain garden, again, for you know bigger storms where you're going to have overflow. You just want to have some controlled way for that water to exit your rain garden. And so here are some examples. Um, again, more urban, but interesting. A curb cut to have water leave your rain garden. Um, I don't love this picture, but I apologize for that. But what this is trying to show is that there's a raised wall in here and that 
allows some ponding behind that wall and then a controlled place for the water to go once it overflows. Rocks are a good uh, river walk, river walk, rock, bleh, river walk, rock is shown here, uh, but rocks in general are good for those areas that are going to easily be eroded. And depending on your slope or how much concentration of flow you have, you might have some need to put in some rock in strategic areas just so you don't end up with erosion. A riser is referring to this drain in the middle where the rain garden fills up all around to a certain level. And then after that level, it reaches that level, then the water is allowed to go into a pipe and leave the rain garden that way. Most likely in your yard, you will not be using anything quite that structural, but just think about Think about if you if your water is leaving the rain garden and just going into your lawn, then you might want to spread it out a little bit with like uh, a French drain or just some way of dispersing the water through your yard so you don't get erosion. If it's going straight into a swale leading to a gutter system, then it's already engineered the way it needs to be and your overflow from the rain garden to that swale probably shouldn't be any problem. Uh, an under drain is another thought where you can, this picture is just showing the large hole and maybe here's an inlet here, water coming in um, through a pipe. And then when the, the this pipe that is serving as the under drain has holes in it. So when you're, it helps with getting the water out of your rain garden underground. And then you would connect it to another outlet. Some of the design don'ts, <clears throat> we don't wanna attract mosquitoes. That's a lot of people's fear about putting in a rain garden is that they're going to get mosquitoes. Mosquitoes like mud flats, and they like, those mud flats are created when water ponds for a long time, kills off the vegetation and then recedes. So if you don't have standing water for more than 48 hours, you won't have mud flats and then you won't have mosquitoes as an issue. Uh, you don't wanna upset your neighbors. I mean, that sometimes is, unavoidable, but there's some ways you can do it just to incorporate it a little more into your, into traditional landscaping, like maybe your neighbors, maybe even if you don't have traditional landscaping, your neighbors do, you can just make it look more purposeful with, you know, mowing an edge or a pretty shape. Um, think about your neighbors when you're thinking about where you're sending your water. If you are taking something that was not concentrated and now you're concentrating it. And um, I feel like I have one more point about that, but maybe I'll think about it and come back to it. And uh, be careful just not to create anything that's unsafe, like a hidden drop off when your vegetation grows up. Uh, think about those drop offs, water depth visibility. Okay, so digging your rain garden, this gets into the nitty gritty a little bit and I'm going to skip this slide for now. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. Um, the general thought here is, here's an example of a six inch deep rain garden on a slope, six inch deep on a slope and one easy way to just make this flat, you're gonna, you're gonna be scooping away your slope and making a flat bottom base of a rain garden. So you could put a stake on the uphill and a stake on the downhill and a string in between. 
so that the string is even with the ground on the uphill side. And that will show you, once you dig that out, you make a berm on that downhill side to keep the water in. And that those stakes in that string will help you decide how tall that berm needs to be. Here's another example on a little bit of a steeper slope where you're having an eight inch deep rain, rain garden. Again, you're just digging away your slope and creating your berm and ending up with that flat bottom. Um, the berm should be about a foot across just so that it doesn't erode away. Compact it down. You can do that by stomping on it. it you, know, you don't need equipment. Um, just make sure the rest of the rain garden has sloping sides that are gentle so that you don't get erosion. Here's an example of a berm at the bottom of this rain garden here. Here's the uphill side. Here's the downspout. Water comes in here and you've got a berm on, on the three sides here. Uh, planting your rain garden, you can seed it. You can put in prairie sod, native vegetated mats are sold by Agricol. I'm not sure if any other nurseries do that sort of thing, but you just roll them out and uh, they make for very easy maintenance. Or you can use potted plants or plugs. Um, seed, I... I don't know that seed is is the best way to go with a smaller rain garden. Um, it is cost effective, but you are likely going to lose a lot of that seed with those water flows. So you're going to want to put down an erosion control blanket just to keep your seed in place. And then you don't really have control over what is coming up. So you know, in a smaller rain garden, you might seed a nice diverse mix and get all of one species just because it's a small area and the conditions are right for that species. So I, I think if you're, if you're uh, going to seed, just be prepared for a longer establishment. I like the combination of seeding with plugs and that would also include that erosion control blanket. Um, sod, like I said before, Agricol sells prairie sod. You can custom grow, they can custom grow them for you if you have certain species in mind. Otherwise they have some that are ready made and you just roll them out and pin them down. Um, the, and, and they'll have more advice for you on that. And then plugs, that, that's my preference. Um, they are, they are still cost effective in, in the small scale when you're doing a small scale planting and planting spacing, I would say one foot on center to two foot on center. One foot on center is going to give you very fast results. Two foot on center is also good. It's, it's going to invite a few more weeds in between. You're gonna have a little more maintenance with that. But since it's two foot on center and we're talking about square feet, you have, if it's two foot on center, you have one plant every four square feet. So it's a lot less of an investment in the first place. And it works well, especially if you're combining it with seeding. Um, we've talked about most of these, just make sure you have cool season grasses in there too, so that you get some, so you don't have to wait until May. Um, heights we've talked about, pioneers we haven't talked about. If you're seeding, it's sometimes, in, it, I like to have pioneers in there. Black-eyed Susan, um, uh, partridge pea. Canada gold, sorry, Canada wild rye are three. Oh, and spiderwort. Those are four plants that come up quickly from seed. So the others don't, 
And you might think that your seeding is a failure when it's not. And these pioneers will help you determine that the seeding took because they'll pop the first year. So some species choices, and these are just ones that I have experience with. There are a lot of choices, but if you're in wetter soils, uh, there are sedges, there are tons of sedges, four that are very resilient are Carex bebei, Carex cristatella, Carex pellita, and Carex vulpinoidea. You can also use bulrushes, rushes, blue joint grass is a very nice, nice one for, um, for rain gardens. Wildflowers, iris, cardinal flower, great blue lobelia, monkey flower, marsh marigold, New England aster, mountain mint. Those are all ones that I've had good experience with. The last two, Joe Pieweed and Obedient Plant are great, but they will also get everywhere. They will not stay in your rain garden. <laughs> Drier species, if you have a rain garden that infiltrates water within 48, 72 hours, you're fine to put in drier species. All of these species will survive those conditions. The wetter species are good if you have water lingering longer than that. So um, some of the grasses that I'm recommending are the shorter grasses. These are all about three feet tall, northern drop seed, big blue stem, June grass, side oats grama, and then some of the sedges grow in the drier as well. Carex vulpinoidea, which I named earlier, is one of them. For wildflowers, uh, butterfly weed, Jacob's Ladder, Blazing Star, Rattlesnake Master, New Jersey Tea, the various cone flowers, pale purple, purple, yellow, um, those are all good. Prairie dock and compass plant are really tall. So be aware of that if you're going to plant these, but their, their greenery is beautiful and they don't get tall until later in the year. So I like to put those in. And then maintaining the rain garden, it's all about weeding. And so, well, first of all, if you use plugs, you will need to water them for best survival. And, um, you know, that's just in case it doesn't rain. Obviously, Mother Nature might water them for you. And we, we say only during the first growing season, really the first six weeks are most important. It's just until they get their roots down into the soil themselves. Um, Weeding is the name of the game, and it's however you want to do it. Hand pulling, herbicide, uh, weed whacking, prescribed burning, if that's allowed and you want to. And you may remove the dead plant material each spring. That'll really help get the sun to the ground and uh, help those, um, especially the wildflowers. Invigorating the natives it's one and the same. If you're weeding and if you're removing the dead plant material, you will be invigorating the natives. Prescribed burning is is really healthy for, for native species while doing weed control. Um, if you're not burning, you are going to also want to remove woody material as it gets in there before it gets too big. Oh, and just, you'll have some bare spots possibly. So just watch for that and fill those in. And then monitor, it's going to be adaptive management. You're going to have different needs every year. So just monitor and um, get out there. If you can get out there uh, four or six times a year, you're going to have a beautiful rain garden. And the need to get out there and, and weed control decreases every year. So after your garden is somewhere between three and five years old, you're probably only needing to get out there once or twice to really maintain a nice garden. And I mentioned some other resources. Here's a page of other resources for you. The Conservation Foundation has conservation at home. And it's, uh, they have a nice checklist of not only rain gardens, but other things you can do 
at home to get their um, stamp of approval back to the neighbors. I said, I, I know there's something I was forgetting. Yeah, uh, they have, if you do conservation at home, you can have a little sign that says conservation at home and explains what your rain garden is. And uh, there are other signs that are for, for purchase uh, that are pretty easy to find as well. That might be one way to help your neighbors understand what you're doing. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has pages and pages and pages of stormwater you know, best management and green stormwater infrastructure, including rain gardens. Blue Thumb, like I mentioned earlier, they have a really nice handbook that is just walks you through how to how to do your own rain garden. Lake County, Illinois, is very they have a very good website. And they have a page called Stormwater Best Practices for Homeowners that you might want to check out. And then as far as uh, stewarding your rain garden, the Nature Conservancy Weed Control Methods Handbook. And for those of you who are more into the calculations, uh, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual. So I want to thank you all for listening and um, I would love to hear what questions you might have. Rebecca, wow, that was fantastic. I, I feel like I learned so much in such a short period of time. So Good. I appreciate that. That was, I think, Thanks. exactly what we needed to hear. Good. Uh, we Wonderful. do have a bunch of questions. I could probably personally ask you um, enough questions to fill up the rest of your evening, but we've gotten a lot of questions in our chat also. And some of them are from earlier on in your presentation. So um, I'll just start from the beginning and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, uh, Leigh Kelly asked, would, and this was in reference to when you were talking about siting the rain garden, um, would it cause water pressure on a foundation at 10 feet away from the house? 10 feet is the, is the guideline. So um, it, it's really site dependent and it depends on factors such as the slope. And um, so, so I think this, this question is, is it okay right at 10 feet? Perhaps. I think that's the question. Yeah. Um, I think you just want to make sure that the water and the roots are being directed away from your foundation. And at 10 feet, the roots should be fine. So you just want to make sure the water's headed the other direction. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Vincent asked, how do rain barrels fit into a rain garden scenario? I'm glad you asked. There was another slide I wanted to put in and I didn't. And it was how to enhance your rain garden, what other things can you do? And there are so many other things you can do. So rain, rain barrel is a perfect example where you could put a rain barrel on your downspout and you could, uh, I, I have less knowledge about rain barrels, but it can be part of a, if you will, a, a stormwater treatment train where the water first might fill up your rain barrel and then once it exits the rain barrel, it might go into your rain garden. That makes sense. Uh, Leigh also asks, if a rain garden should not be where it's already wet, what does one do when most of their town is wet and has a high water table? Oh, it sounds like my neighborhood. And I just put it in anyway. And I have little wet pockets in my rain garden. And I still call it a rain garden, but... I guess technically a rain garden um, infiltrates into the soil, whereas what you might have, what you might end up with, is a constructed wetland, and that's totally fine. All of the rest of the guidelines still fit. You just want to pick the vegetation that will grow in a wetland, and if you are going to end up with standing water, I would encourage you to limit it to about six inches deep if it's going to be standing for a long time and then plant uh, native plants that you would find on uh, an emergent plant list. Those uh, plants, those plants will grow in six inches of standing water. 
iris and cardinal flower and great blue lobelia and swamp milkweed are all examples. A lot of the sedges will. Okay, great. Um, Penny is from Texas and she asks, can you do this in the hill country of Texas? We have very rocky land. Uh, I have been to the hill country. Um, yes, the answer is yes, you can. Um, I What I'm not familiar with with the hill country, do you have water right issues like the arid west Rocky Mountain area? I know in the Rocky Mountains, there might be some uh, water rights that you aren't actually allowed to detain the water. So you might wanna look into that. I'm not familiar with, with your area well enough to know, but it's just one thing to keep in mind. That is crazy hearing that from us Illinois people that you can't mm -hmm. collect water from your own roof. Right. Okay, Sunita asks, uh, I have one downspout where we have an extended pipe which goes several feet and then it ends in a flower bed and grass. No, there is no water standing as it seems to percolate. So do they still need a rain garden? Um, really what, if, if you're wondering if you need a rain garden, do you know, is water leaving your property? Because the situation that you just described sounds great. And ideally you have enough lawn and flower garden area there that your water is sheet flowing into that and it's being absorbed or infiltrated into the ground. Um, but if it's not all being infiltrated into the ground and some of it is leaving your property, then you could you could uh, benefit from a rain garden. Okay. Um, we have a question from Fawn. Can Penstemon digitalis be used in rain gardens? It's a great flower for pollinators, native, and it's mid-spring in central Illinois, mid-spring bloomer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you just wanna fit it to, you wanna make sure you have the right soil and sun conditions for it. And then absolutely, it's a good one. That is a pretty flower. Mm -hmm. um, Tom asks, if I cut the area with a lawnmower, do I remove the leftover fluff or leave it as kind of a compost cover? You want the sun to get down. If we're talking about spring, and you're you're cutting off the if you're cutting off the dead from the winter, mm -hmm. you pro you just want to make sure the sun is going to get to the ground and you don't have too much mulch layer left. So if it's light, it's okay to leave it, and if it's going to shade out the new tr plants that are trying to germinate, I I would take the extra step and get it off there. Okay. Lots of people are saying thank you. It was a great presentation. Oh, good. <laughs> Barbara, however, is saying, can you talk a little bit more about a constructed wetland garden that you mentioned? Sure. So a constructed wetland is going to be exactly like a rain garden, but it's going to be in an area where the soil is so clayey that it's not, it doesn't infiltrate very fast. So it's going to collect water and the water is going to sit there. Um, a lot of times these areas were, were wetlands and then drainage was designed away from them. And that, that's why, that's why the soils are clay because they formed under those wet conditions. So takes a lot of research to know if that's your situation, but let's say it is, you're, you're restoring a wetland. Um, and so you, what, what else can I say about that? I can talk about um, all the guidance is the same as far as constructing the area. You definitely want an overflow because you're going to have a lot of times where water is not going to infiltrate fast enough and you're going to need to get that water from your rain garden um, along, along its way, unless your rain garden is big enough. Um, the plant selection is going to be wetland plants, obligate wetland plants. Um, 
I, I mentioned this before, but you want to limit your depth to six inches so you don't drown out your plants. Um, common arrowhead is another really good one in that situation that'll take off and be attractive and not too tall. It's nice greenery, lasts all year long. Um, and then a lot of the species that I had on that slide about wetter species choices. But if you just Google wetland emergent or wetland obligate, obligate plants, you're going to come up with some good ones. And then you can just flip through and see which ones you like. That sounds great. Uh, Fawn is also asking if you have a chart to refer to as far as how long the roots are of our native wildflowers. She says, I would think these are the species that help rainwater in a rain garden drain more readily and more deeply. Um, if you're looking for, there's not that much information out there specific to the different species, but there is one diagram that I see over and over again and the author is Heidi Natura, N-A-T-U-R-A. So if you Google prairie plant roots, Heidi Natura, you probably get, get the image that I'm talking about. And it does have specific species with specific root lengths, but there's only about maybe a dozen on there. Okay. Um, question I had is about woodies. Do trees or shrubs do anything in a rain garden? Are they helpful, harmful? Um, they're helpful. Trees and shrubs. Trees are uh, a little bit more um, talked about, studied. The, the water uptake from trees is very great. And that's part of the goal here. So uptake and then evaporation from there. And so... I guess I would say there are certain trees that are going to cause more maintenance issues and certain trees that are going to behave, if you will. <laughs> and so uh, oaks, um, hickories, hickories are great for bats and then bats eat mosquitoes. And so the story goes, um, those species are going to behave Maple trees are going to be more maintenance just because they're, they germinate so easily. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm generalizing here. There might be some maples that behave better than others, but um, I think having a couple trees, shrubs in your rain garden is great. And when I was talking about controlling woodies, I was talking more about the volunteer invasive species that will make their way in there eventually. We know those all too well around here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, another question I had is about um, the incoming water. Sometimes we get those storms that just come down in a downpour. Do we need to have any type of, I don't know, rocks or something to kind of slow the water down a little bit? With the inflow? Yeah, it's absolutely possible. And it again depends on your slope and concentration of water coming in. But yeah, that would be another place to reinforce with rock. Thank you. Okay. And no liners or anything like that ever, right? Not in a rain garden. If you were making, if you wanted ponding to happen, then you would put a liner in. Okay. Um. Another question, can you or do you build cascades of rain gardens on slopes? Yes, you can. That does sound pretty. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So just have one rain garden flow into another rain garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds nice. Well, um, our, I think we are done with the questions that people have submitted. If anyone has any last ones, um, put them in there. Um, Otherwise, I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody that's written thank you in the chat and has said um, how much they appreciated this because I found this program fascinating. So I'm I'm sure everyone yeah. else is also um, absorbing, which I think is a good pun for <laughs> your talk tonight. 
Well, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody's attention and interest in this topic.